you hit record back there. Okay, cool. So. Okay, so yeah, we are we're not talking about Drupal for Facebook, which Tom had up on the screen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, we're talking about uh, Facebook basics for business. So if you're kind of mid-level or advanced with Facebook or social media, this may be a little bit uh, basic for you. Um, hopefully there still, is, there still are a couple of nuggets. If not, you can leave now. Or there's food and beer over there. A um, couple of things we won't talk about tonight because we'll talk about them at later uh, events are going to be specifically strategies in order to gain followers and fans on Facebook. And the other thing we're not going to really talk about um, is, is uh, doing Facebook advertising, so using their pay-per-click platform, because, again, we're going to talk about that later on. And, uh, you know, we could go through uh, tons of stuff on Facebook itself and take up, you know, a, a full weekend, but we've only got an hour today. So thanks to Tom and Level 10 for hosting us tonight there. Uh, pretty gracious and, and pretty giving with uh, as many events as they hold out of this office, and I have no idea how much beer he has given away. Um, you can find that on my website, so let's go to the next page. So, uh, again, this is, this is uh, Facebook Basics, and uh, what I want to do is kind of level set, kind of get you guys understanding what all the different pieces are that you have to deal with. We're not going to deal with all this stuff, and you guys will get this afterwards too, so don't kill yourself by trying to write everything down because I'll let you download the stuff when we're done. And like, like Tom said, we'll have this up on YouTube as well. Um, a couple of the, the things, though, that, that we're familiar with are in this list. Other things that you need to be concerned about and some small differences we'll talk about uh, during the presentation today. A um, couple of things that are kind of weird uh, that we have specific names for is, is the composer in Facebook is nothing more than your text box that when you log into your Facebook page, place where you type something in, you add an image, you add a video or something, they call that the composer. Uh, we're really not going to cover that a whole lot, but as you get into Facebook marketing, you may hear some of these things referenced, so I want you to kind of be level set with where they're at. Obviously, likes are when somebody clicks a like. They really don't do anything for you other than make you feel good because a lot of people clicked it. Um, updating and comments are ways that you and your fans and friends update your, uh, your, your site. Uh, we're going to talk quite a bit about setting milestones, looking at Facebook Insights, which is the analytics platform. So they, it, Facebook gives you an entire platform on your business page where you can look and see what's happening and make decisions about what you want to do in the future. We're going to talk about that uh, quite a bit today. Um, and a little bit different uh, thing here is, is with Facebook's new layout, we have the new Facebook timeline, which is essentially your wall now. You don't have a Facebook wall anymore. They call it the timeline. And then the news feeds are the inf is all the information from all the people that you're connected with that rolls up and down on your page on, on the right-hand side of, of the page. Um, friends, fans, subscribers, basically friends are people you're connected with on your personal page. Uh, fans are people that have gone and liked or, fan, or, or friended your business page. And then subscribers are people who go in. If you allow people to subscribe to your content off your personal page or they subscribe to an RSS feed, that's a different type of user. The main reason why you'd have a difference between friends and subscribers on your personal uh, Facebook profile, sub subscribers cannot go and comment unless you let them on your profile. Friends get a lot more access to information. Hey, there's my remote. Look at that. Okay, so let's talk about what we do when we set up a campaign. Now, we're going to go through actually setting up a fake company on Facebook tonight, but um, a few things that we need to talk about about strategy before we go when we set up our pages. Number one, make sure you do all the basic things you do in marketing. So this class is kind of part, uh, partially technical, partially, partially kind of marketing and communications. Um, when you go in to set up your Facebook fan page or your business page, you need to make sure that you're going to be doing stuff on that that's going to differentiate you from the, your competitors. Um, in some industries, just the fact that you're doing that is sometimes enough. Uh, but, but look at what I would typically ask people to do is look for your competitors that are online now, see what they're doing, and see what's missing as far as the things that you might be able to provide an audience so that, they will, that you can drive them to your page. Make sure that you target the people properly that you want to get access to. And in the same way that if you're going to go and do advertising in a newspaper, in a magazine, on a billboard, on the radio, on the TV, you would go and you would talk to somebody about where your audience might be. 
Facebook is no different. And specifically, whenever we're talking about Facebook targeting, we're talking about number one, the type of content you produce and put up on your page, which would be content that is going to draw in your audience. Or number two, when we do the class on Facebook advertising, we get into some really granular targeting for fans that we can go. And it's amazing how detailed you can get with the people that you attract on Facebook. Obviously, make sure you're relevant. Meaning, make sure you have something important to say to the people that, that you want to attract on your page. Have a budget. Um, this is one of the biggest problems with social media in general, is that people want to start social, social media campaigns thinking that it's free and it's easy. It's not free. Well, I would say that it can be easy, but it does, it does require a lot of ditch digging and a lot of legwork. So make sure that when you sit down and you're going to start rolling into this, a budget doesn't necessarily have to be money. But you've got to budget your time. You've got to make sure you budget you know, how you go and curate content for the web. You've got to budget your effort or your staff's effort in order for them to participate with your company if you're more than a one man or, or a one woman show. Make sure you define what number one your return on investment is if you are spending money, if you're getting graphics done, if you're paying for content to be created and things like that, and your return on effort. This stuff can take an awful lot amount, a lot of time. And if I can, I am mirrored here, aren't I? Yes. Let's see if I've got this up. Is that up there? Of course it's not. There we go. Let's see. I'm going to flash this to you guys. Not in that way, but I'm going to show you what I typically have as the background of my desktop in order for me to manage my time and all my responsibilities. And so, important. Let's see. So if I go to pictures... It's not there, is it? You're gonna. This right here is the desktop that I typically leave on my computer at home. And it's got a list of prospects. Over here, I've got all the different uh, social media things I wanna work on, the, the projects I'm working on, publishing, speaking engagements, things with photography and video. And the, because I am, I have absolutely no attention span whatsoever, doing something like this, allows me to all the time be forced at looking at an entire, an entire view of everything that I have going on. And if you look at this line, you can't see the line very well, but this is maintenance, and these are the things that I want to accomplish every single day. Um, and I'll cut this off. Anybody who e emails me or you send me a tweet, I'll, I'll cut this off to you. Basically, I have how many blog posts, how many tweets need to go out on a daily basis, how many comments on YouTube. I look at Delicious, Stumble Upon, Pinterest. Um, I've got Foursquare, Google Plus listed here, LinkedIn, Meetup.com, Pure Volume, Reverb Nation, SoundCloud, Tumblr, Sound Tracking, Stumble Upon, and YouTube. And it'll say like Sound Tracking, Track Music, Stumble Upon, to Five Total Actions, YouTube, Respond to All Comments, Comments on Open Clients, and 15 Other Actions. And these are things that I wake up in the morning and I start doing all day long and I spread it out throughout the day. And because I've got this in front of me and I know what pro projects and everything I'm working on, it forces me to be focused and, and any time I, I, I minimize the window on my desktop, boom, it's right there screaming at me. Um, that's uh, kind of uh, extreme and maybe even a little bit embarrassing that I have to do that. But it's really critical that you make a plan and that you're, that, that you're focused and you know what you're doing within, within your social media uh, campaigns every single day. And this, you know, if you're only focusing on Facebook, awesome, your list is a lot shorter. But you've got to do this stuff every day. Um, and then lastly, make sure that you have goals. So when you sit down and you start doing, uh, uh, putting together all this stuff for your Facebook account or if you've got one now, and you're start, starting to think about how do I go and achieve what I want to achieve. Number one is the goals on Facebook need to align with whatever that business is that you're promoting. Okay? So if your business is sales, let's just keep dumb it down. If your business is sales, well, if I want to use Facebook to drive sales, well, Facebook is not necessarily a sales channel, but it certainly is a lead channel. So you need to make sure that what am I doing to go and attract leads so that I can talk to people and then push them through the sales funnel later on. And your behavior, behaviors, 80% of the time, need to be applied towards that. 20% of the time is just you. We just want to talk to you. So dumb. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I get, I get kind of wrapped up sometimes in, in how much time we spend trying to be authentic online and nothing about what we do is authentic. Um, when you're in the middle of your campaign, uh, make sure that you give th things for people to talk about. It doesn't mean you have to be crazy and wild and have pictures of like kittens hanging from trees and stuff like that. But you need to do with, within the industry that you're focused on, make sure that you're providing content, and this is the big kicker, that nobody can get anywhere else. When we look at content on the internet and we look at all of us out there shoving all the information around the web, 90% of us take information and all we do is read it. 8% of us repurpose content. We are actually people that push stuff around. Less than 2% of the people on the internet that are on these social media sites generate and create brand new content that we've never seen before. So if you can find a way to write original blog posts, to create original photography, create original videos, you're already in the top 2% of all the people on the internet. And again, there's an investment in time there and an investment in effort, but, but it's an easy way for you to rise above to, 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 to the top. Make sure that whenever you're doing things in Facebook, that you're doing all you can without being obnoxious to lead people to a point of conversion. You want to send somebody there because typically Facebook is not the end all be all. And it doesn't mean that everything you post up on Facebook has to be a call to action, but you need to be focused on the fact that while I'm engaging, while I'm talking to customers, while I'm talking to people who are not happy with my competitors, every now and again, if we can, and again, I hate being a used car salesman, but every now and again, we want to make sure that we're driving people somewhere where they can convert. And a conversion doesn't have to be a sell. A conversion can be a happy birthday, which Leanne is amazing about every single week. A conversion can be downloading a form. It can be filling out a form. A conversion can be liking your fan page. But you need to be doing things that causes someone to act against your brand to make your brand stronger. Make sure that you provide people with a way to engage. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You've got to be engaged. That ridiculous desktop that I have forces me to be engaged online every single day. Then make sure that you provide them with the means and the incentive to share stuff. We'll talk about those in a little bit as well. And uh, we want to make sure that whenever we define our goals that, that we always keep those in mind. I just mentioned that. Make sure that you have a target audience and you're focusing on that when you're communicating online. Determine your goals and your objectives and make sure you're, you're following through with that stuff. Make sure that the tactics that you develop are ones that you actually can implement. A lot of people can come up with amazing ideas about things they want to do online. But then the implementation part was funny because David just kind of walked through there and Dave and Tom were talking about, we always have great ideas, it's the implementation that's tough. Um, make sure that you monitor what's going on, and we'll talk about uh, Facebook Insight here in a little bit. Make sure you're measuring the reaction to the different content that you create, and then the stuff that people respond to, do more of it. The stuff that people don't respond to, stop it. It's pretty simple. And they give you all the tools to look at, and then you kind of go through that list again. I hate not having that extra, the, the, the next slide in front of me. So I'm going to assume, let, let, let me ask this. How many people in the room have a Facebook account now? Yay. Okay, skip that slide. Um, I wasn't going to actually create an account, but I'm assuming everyone does. And if you don't, you go to Facebook.com, and it's one page literally to fill out. Uh, so we're going to go and we're going to create a, a uh, business page. And the benefit of, not, of having these mirrored is I can actually look at my desktop. So... Um, the main things we're going to look at is what category our business belongs to, the specific category because you get more detailed. We're going to read the terms of service and we're going to provide info to establish our admin. So this is basically what the page, whenever you go to Facebook and, and you're logged in, you can either go to Google and say create a page in Google and it'll give you this page or on Facebook itself you can say create a business page or create a page in their, in their search box and this page will pop up for you. So with that, we are going to go to that page, and this is it right here live. And we're going to create a new business in Facebook. There's our news feed. Are y'all paying attention to that? Okay, so we're going to create a local business. So when we click that button, this guy pops up and we provide some information for Facebook. So I'm going to choose a category, and I'm going to open up a new airport. And it's going to be geos. It's going to be called the Geoport. And oh, I don't have text expander on here. That's killing me. Okay. Now, one thing that's really cool about this is that whenever you are 
creating this content and you're plugging in your, your information here, this has a positive impact in local search in Google if you make this stuff public. So um, kind of think about it. We'll talk about SEO here a little bit later on. But the things that you're doing here kind of impact you across the web in many different places. Plain old Texas. Okay, sure, I read that and I agree to it. I wonder if it'll let me open up an airport. Holy cow, they will. That's craziness. Okay, so, tell you what, that's crazy. You can open up anything. It's America. Let's find a picture for my airport. Just grab a random one here, make sure it's okay. Fashion shoot. Grab anything, anything that we can, okay, we'll take one of the Troubadour Texas bus, upload it. And there's my logo for my new airport. About, this is my, let's see, you can't buy tickets here. Um, let's see. Geoport.com, of course, is the name of the air, the website. And now it's going to ask me for my web address. This is unbelievably important because, number one, whenever you select what you're going to make your website be on Google, you can never, ever, ever go and change it. If you misspell it, you're out of luck. And if you use this for something here, just testing it out, you can never get it back. So make sure that if you're kind of walking through this interface, and you're coming up just to see what this is like, do not plug in what you, what you want your final web page to be because you will lose that name forever. So we're going to leave it at Geoport because I'm never going to open up an airport. I'm pretty safe with that. And that's the address. So now when people go to facebook.com slash Geoport, they're going to come up with my brand new page, and this, this is live. Um, and I think I'm going to go ahead and like it. Now, I can't, this is kind of weird. I cannot administer this page unless I like it first. No, no, you can't have any admins on a Facebook or, or business page that can administer it unless they like it. So they're kind of forcing me to do that. I'm not going to invite my friends, but, but Facebook is going to walk me through a few different interfaces here, asking me to give them as much personal information as I possibly can ask for. Post on my timeline. Thank you. Hi, I opened, y'all quit looking at me, I, I get nervous and I make typos. Open an airport, post it, and then voila, we're live. And we have a map over here with the location of where my airport is, my new logo. Um, I'm going to facebook.com slash geoport, so that's signed, sealed, and delivered, and I've got my basic data here. And this thing's live, this is ready to go. Um, if I was to... Uh, Go to another website and then just type in facebook.com slash geoport. I could give this address out to anybody and we hope it's going to come up since I just said it would. There it is. So there it is. And it's live and you, this is the admin panel. We'll talk about the admin panel in a second. Um, it's already asking me to invite folks. I'm going to invite my mom. She's going to freak out. I'll invite her and see if she will. She's always on Facebook. She has nothing else to do. <laughs> okay, so there it is. Um, can I ask a question? You sure can. I'm not taking questions, actually. No. Yes, you can ask a question. <laughs> All right, so you were saying you can only enter the URL once? Yes. You can't edit it ever? Never, ever, ever, ever. It's gone forever. You do have to put something in. You can't change it. So what, what I recommend, if this makes you nervous doing this, I'd go in and test it out once with just some kind of a fake company. And then, and then once you, you're kind of familiar with the interface, and you feel, I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't just go ahead and do it the first time anyway. But if you're nervous, I would just plug in just, you know, just uh, gibberish in there for that, for that first uh, time that you try it. And then um, once you're comfortable with it, go back and put your real name. Now, it, it is fairly imperative that you go and, kind of grab your brand name anyway. So you, you could go in and just, just by doing what we did right there, by grabbing the name, all I did was add a couple of pictures and plug in the address. You can change the address later. 
So there's nothing wrong with going in and like going ahead and grabbing your brand name and squatting on it and then going back and finishing it later as long as you have access to it, you know, and, and you won't lose it to a competitor or somebody who has a similar company. Uh, but that, but that, you know, that's pretty much what any Facebook, you know, profile page looks like now. So we're live and we're good to go there. So the admin panel. Uh, a couple of features on the admin panel. After your site's been live for 30 days, they'll start giving you stats in, in Facebook Insights, and you can click on this, and we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, but whenever you come in and you look at your, 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 your business page, this admin panel basically takes up the top part of the screen, but you click that hide button and it rolls back up and you see that page the way your visitors see it. Um, I keep on forgetting my uh, remote. Basic stuff you can do. Up there is where your navigation is and you've got a promote button here. Basically you go up here to manage permissions, administrators, edit information on the page. Um, if when we go and do the class on, on Facebook pay-per-click advertising, this is where we're going to go to under build the audience. And then if you have any questions, Facebook does have tons and tons of, of, of uh, uh, pages helping you walk through interfaces and telling you how to do stuff on Facebook. Um, if you want to learn and see how to do things the way Facebook would like you to do them, read through that stuff. And there's hardly ever any situation where they don't have some kind of an answer for, but it's going to be the corporate answer. I would still recommend going and doing a Google search on what you want to do and see if there's other best practices that Facebook doesn't promote um, in, the, in, in public because maybe they don't want you to know how to do stuff. Uh, and then uh, this promotion button is basically a tie into the pay-per-click campaign. Um, that we'll talk about when we do another class, but, but, but they give you some really nice tools to, eat, to go in there and budget your money to tell you how much you're going to spend per day and also help you target an audience, but for another day for us. So uh, let's do some basic editing on our page. So basically, this is my page. What I want to do is, is anybody logged into Facebook right now? Yes. Um, the first one that likes that Geoport gets to become an admin with me. It's a race. Oh, already? <laughs> so let's see. So you go and you create your business page. You got three likes on here. Anytime anybody at all uh, is going to join the administrative team, they have to like the page first. So Leela is going to become an admin. How did I lose her there? Let me go back to here. They took away my menu over there. Okay, so we're going to go back up and I'm going to say admin roles. And I'm going to type in the name of Leela. Is it Lela or Leela? Leah. Leah. I've only known of you for years. It's like you know people on the internet forever and then you don't know how to pronounce their name. And it's going to find her and make her an admin. It should. Let's. No, it didn't. Why didn't it? There we go. Okay, so now she's a manager. Basically, their new name for an admin. She has access to anything she wants to on the site. Um, everything you need access to to manage your business, your page over here is going to be in the left-hand column over here for you. So, uh, number one, do you allow people to post freely on your page, or do you restrict that and have to approve everything? Um, do you want to be notified about every single thing that happens? The email notifications and permissions are quite daunting. Uh, they, they allow you, because they're trying to give you full control over your privacy and your notifications, literally access to so much stuff that it just makes your head spin. Um, managing permissions is, uh, you know, what can people do on the site? Who, who can see the page? Either, uh, if you're just working on it, you're not ready for it to be public, you can unpublish it, but you can still access to it. It's still there. What countries can or cannot see it? Age restrictions on the page who can post on the site, who can tag. And the thing, the thing like tagging, 
tagging is fairly important from a brand reputation standpoint because if you allow anybody, if I allow anyone to go in and brand any or tag any picture they want to Geoport, what can happen is they can put pornography up on a site, tag Geoport on there, and that shows up on the home page of my site. So I would recommend that you don't allow people to do stuff unless you vet them first, especially the tagging stuff. I just would turn that off completely. You'll get a notification when someone tries to tag something with your brand, and then you can approve it if it's appropriate or if it's something that actually makes your, your company look good. Um, your basic information, again, all this kind of stuff right here, as long as your site is set to public, all of this stuff helps you with the search results whenever people are searching for stuff on, on Google. And you can, let's see if this works. See how much of my stuff, right there. So the fourth one that comes up, because I allow Google to come in and crawl my content fairly freely. If I didn't, that listing would not show up at all. I mean, and, and by default, all that stuff is turned off. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit in the SEO part. You're more specific with the kind of products you look, you, you, you're, being, you're being found for? Um, the search visibility oh, on, so by, default, by default it's turned off because Facebook doesn't really want Google crawling the content, but they, give, they allow us to turn it off if we want to. Um, official page, um, basically you can, get, you can get subject matter. These types of things, whenever we do a class on search engine optimization, I would tend to kind of tell you that you can plug whatever you want to in right here, but whenever you learn about search engine optimization and learn about keyword research, those are the types of phrases that, needs, that need to go into these two boxes. And basically the keywords that we're talking about are, you go to Google, if you go to Google and type in keyword research tool, it'll pop up a web page and you can plug in a, a word or a phrase that you think describes your business and Google will tell you how often that is searched on on Google in the previous 30 days. So you can get a good idea about whether or not you're using words and phrases that people on the internet are using to find your brand. But again, we don't have a whole lot of time to go through all that stuff. Um, I can change my username right now, and I, I've got to step back a little bit. Um, up until 25 people are following my page, I can change that username. So I, I will step back with what I told you. As soon as 25 people are following your page, that's locked off forever because people have made mistakes. Yes, sir? Yes. It could be anybody. Anybody at all. Yes, 25 is the number. Once you get there, then you, then you can't change that username anymore. And then we already filled this stuff in previously. But obviously all, all, all the typical stuff here are our profile, picture, featured information. Um, basically, whenever you're starting to go and getting to featured stories, that was one of the first things that I put up on, on that first slide. Feature stories are basically whenever you post something up on your Facebook wall, I still call it a wall, if you feature that item, it will stay at the top even as you post more stuff below it. So feed, whenever you say something is featured on, on your business page, that means that it stays up at the top and you can either set a date to make it expire or you leave it up there until you go manually and pull it back off. So you could have a sale going on, you could have a special, you could be doing a contest, and even though you're, you're still engaged with, your, with your, the people on your wall, you still want to make sure that thing floats to the top and they allow you to do that there. Um, all, all kinds of different information. The resources tab is basically your FAQ for everything Facebook from Facebook itself. So think of the resources tab is basically whenever you have to have a general thing, a question you know, answered about inviting email contacts, using the plugins on the site, linking your page to Twitter. They've got tons and tons of information on the site here for you to go in and, and find that information. We've already been on that page, our admin roles. Applications tells you what apps are currently tied to your business page. So if I went back up to the resources and I followed their instructions on tying Twitter to my account, when I clicked on apps, then Twitter would be listed here. If I tied YouTube directly to my account, YouTube would be listed here. So if, if your page is ever doing something kind of wanky and you're not quite sure why, you know, stuff's showing up on your site or things are looking weird, the first place I would come to is the apps tab under administration and see what different applications are pushing content to your site. It's the first place you look whenever you're troubleshooting. Um, this is my lifeblood. Um, whenever you create uh, your business page, Facebook assigns you an email. If you send something to that email address, it shows up on your Facebook wall, number one. Number two, if you plug in your phone number through SMS or you, or you have your Facebook application on your iPhone tied in, you can post from Facebook as well. The SMS 
is my lifeblood because I do like 80% of my social networking through text messaging because I have these applications, send information when people post on my walls and on Twitter and YouTube and stuff, and I respond directly from my phone. I never have to log in. One, one of the caveats here, though, is that you can only assign one phone number to a personal profile or a business page. So if you've got like four businesses, you can't have all four of them sending you text messages. Facebook will only allow you to have one phone number per profile or page. So pick your most important one. You could, and the, the thing that's weird about that, though, is that if Google doesn't see voice calls going back and forth after like 30 days or so, they delete the account because they've got to save the numbers. So if you're using Google Voice, you could potentially use Skype, and then Skype is all weird because it like comes up as random numbers. Um, I've got my youngest daughter on Skype because I won't let her have text messaging yet. And it's like every time she calls me, it seems like she's calling from Algeria or something. I have no idea it's her. And I've got to like wait for her to leave a message. But then I don't know what to call her back on, you know, if, I, if I'm looking at that number. It's kind of weird how that operates. But I'm sure there's, there's plenty of ways around that. But I know I've tried Google Voice. And after 30 days, I get an email from Google saying, if you don't call this number in X amount of hours, we're going to delete it because we've got to save the number for ourselves. Uh, we'll go into insights here in a little bit, and then whenever we go through, um, go back please, whenever we talk about the pay-per-click in the later class, we'll, talk, we'll cover Facebook deals and coupons and stuff like that at, that at that point in time. So that's basically a walkthrough of your admin page and your editing. Let's talk a little bit about consistency across your brand. Um, and this is a really good example compared to what I've seen in the past, it's not exactly perfect. But whenever we're talking about brand consistency, it's really critical that as you go and start creating these new accounts for your business or for whatever you're doing this for, make sure that the look and feel across these networks to the extent that you can is consistent across all of them. Now with the level 10 stuff, it's very easy to see that I've got the level 10 logo with, with, with the blue and the green logo here. The logo is here. The blue is here. That's a slightly older logo. Cause is, is the blue green the new one or the blue blue the new one, Tom? On the logos? That one's the correct one. This one out here? Yeah. Okay, so on the Twitter I account. Where that one came from. Yeah, so the Twitter account we need to update. And I'm wondering if that's even just the monitor because it's like a weird purple up there. But basically what we're looking for, and, and, and if, you, if you walk out to the front, um, of the office, you'll see that they have their wall painted with all the, with the, this tag cloud. So that's where that tag cloud comes from. Um, we're working on the views and the interaction on the YouTube channel so we can get that converted over to a partner page so we can do a lot more with, with uh, the background and stuff there. But if you look at the, the Twitter account as well, it matches up with this stuff. The reason why this is, is critical is that a lot of times people go up and either you're a big enough company that you're letting multiple people handle different accounts because they have like expertise in areas, but they're not talking about con being consistent across all those accounts. So number one, you will see that from a design perspective, they look a little bit different, which is kind of weird for your customers because they're not quite sure if it's you or not. Um, secondly, you've got to make sure that especially for a corporate account or for a brand account, that the voice is consistent across the different platforms to the, to the extent that it makes sense. So clearly, if we're you know, looking at Facebook versus Twitter, the voice is a little bit different. Tw Twitter tends to be a little bit more informal, um, and, and you can do a lot more kind of quirky stuff. And, and Facebook is not by any means very formal at all. But when you look at something like LinkedIn, you don't want to be up on LinkedIn goofing off and being silly with your brand. But you do want to make sure that whatever voice you pick up on these channels, that there's some consistency across all those, th those networks so that people understand that they're dealing with the same company. Level 10 is a good example because there's probably 30 different Level 10 companies across the U.S. that do different types of things in the interactive and design space. So it's funny because in this slide here with consistency, if you go to Facebook.com Level 10, you get Tom's company. If you go to Twitter.com Level 10, you get Tom's company. If you go to YouTube.com Level 10, you get some random guy who uploaded three videos four years ago. And Level 10 is managing two other accounts on YouTube, but, but missed the boat on this first one because there's a lot of people out there this brand. And uh, 
Um, one thing that we can do in this area, and I've already put in a support desk, because this account has been stagnant for three years, I put a request into YouTube to, get, to give us that brand because we own it across the other platforms and it's a business and this person apparently is not using this anymore. So if Google looks at that and sees that that person's Gmail account is dead and they've never signed up to Google Plus and stuff like that, they'll go ahead and delete the account and give it to us. So on any social network, if you feel like you need to go and see if you can go and capture your brand back because somebody may have squatted on it and either they're using it for, you know, just for advertising or things like that, they're spamming people, or if the account is just basically just dead and there's no activity, make a request to take that name back and in most cases you'll get it back. It may take six weeks to get a response, but, you know, it's, it's better than nothing. Um, so we talked a little bit about you know the, those different uh, boxes on on the administrative pages about search engine optimization. Now, by default, and we're not going to we're not going to have any discussion about how do you do SEO today. Um, but as far as just visibility in search engines, um, number one is you need to make sure that you're consistent across all your social media platforms because when Microsoft and Yahoo and Google look and they see you on LinkedIn, when they see you on Twitter, when Clout sees you across. YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and all these different sites, they're looking to try to match up words to see where the, where the same words are, are being used across all those different platforms. Because computers can't understand context, they typically don't know that Apple and Apple are kind of different. They have to look at the other words around Apple to see if you're talking about fruit or computers. Now for us, we can see a picture of an Apple computer and an a, a piece of fruit and know that there's a big difference. Computers don't typically know. Um, so we've got to make sure that across all of our different platforms, um, it's cute and it's fun to have like a YouTube channel where you've got like guys skateboarding through the hallway and you know the barbecue and stuff like that, but that kills your branding online because it confuses the search engines. Um, backlinking, just like you go out and you try to get links from other sites for your corporate website, it works the exact same way for your social media sites. So if you can go and do things like guest blog posts or write articles for the local newspaper that can get published online, in the boilerplate underneath the information about who you are, see, you first want to get your corporate, your, your corporate website slipped in there with a hyperlink. If possible, they'll let you say, connect with me socially on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, whatever your accounts are, and put links in there. Because... When, you know, it's one thing, and I, I, it, it's dumb to use my name if, as an example because there's so many Giovanni Gallucci's out there. Um, but, you know, whenever you're going and you're searching for your brand, one of the things you want to make sure is that your competition doesn't creep up and steal some of those, those slots in that home page for you. And the way that you can own all 10 slots in Google for your brand is by making sure you're on a bunch of social networks and making sure that they're all optimized properly for your brand name. Because the worst thing in the world for you is A, your brand name sucks showing up or your competitor showing up because they optimized for your brand name and you didn't. And it happens all the time. Um, make sure that your wall posts, that you understand that when you're going, you're optimizing this stuff. This is when we get into the, the, the return on the, the uh, effort that you put into this stuff. As soon as that wall post drops off that front page of, of Facebook, Google just kind of forgets. Google's really not digging too far deep into Facebook because it's just such a huge platform. Um, so just know that when you're up and, and you want to be known for, for say, say you, after you do your keyword research, there's like 10 words or phrases that your company or your brand needs to be known for. You need to make sure that those 10 items are printed on a piece of paper and stuck to a wall or taped to a monitor. And that every time you're doing anything in social media, you go out there and you talk to people, you do whatever. Before you hit post, you glance at that list and see if you can fit any one of those inside of what you just typed in without it sounding ridiculous. Don't get out there and sacrifice your voice and make it sound like you're stuffing keywords into commentary. But if you can go and grab something and put it inside of a, a, a post that you're putting up online, that helps keep your brand strong online across all the different websites that you're working on. Um, I'd mentioned earlier, when you go into your admin page, make sure that you mark that your stuff is public. And, and, and Facebook over the years has, has called some stuff public and called uh, sometimes they've called it visible to search. Either way, make sure that that's marked right now. It says public. Um, put your keywords in the right place. This, this is kind of SEO 101. But 
We'll talk about imagery here in a little bit, but whenever you have like videos and pictures that you post up on Facebook, if you guys have words that are printed graphically inside those things, the search engine can't read those words. They have no idea what they are. Now there, is way to, what, there are ways to get text inside of those files we'll talk about in a little bit, but you've got to make sure that when you decide what the words are that you want to be known for across the entire internet, that those are going inside your post. And this is the same thing is making sure that when you're backlinking that those words are around those links. Whenever you, you're aware that these things are time sensitive, the reason why you have to be concerned about it being time sensitive that you've got to take your 10 words and constantly be feeding those into the conversation about your brand. Um, we'll talk about optimizing multimedia and particularly I'm talking about photography and video here. We'll talk about those in a couple of slides. And run your page well. If someone shows up, if you have a brick and mortar store and they walk up and there's a bunch of trash and crap out in the front and the windows are all icky and they open the door and the cat did its business over there because you're really cool and hip and you got a cat in the office and stuff like that. People get icky and they leave. If people go to your Facebook page, if they go to your Twitter account, YouTube account, your, your, your website itself, and if it doesn't, I don't have to say, I'm not going to say that it has to look amazing, but if it looks off, then that matters and it hurts you. Um, and I want to credit Tom with this quote, but I may be overstepping my bounds. Um, when something works right, nobody notices. Was that you? Yeah. That was Tom. Good job on that. I remembered. Yes. Security. Yeah. So when people go to your Facebook page and it looks amazing, no one's going to tell you. No one's going to notice. When it looks like junk, they're going to tell you or they're just going to leave and they'll never tell you. So it's really critical that you understand that when you're creating your Facebook page, your Twitter account, when you're doing all this stuff, you've got to spend the time and the money, if you're not a graphic designer, making this stuff look amazing. Because if not, you'll never hear about it and you'll never ring the register because people will just leave and find someone else that looks prettier. That's the way I've lived my whole life, being one of the beautiful people. I've never had to try. <laughs> so um, content creation uh, 101 using magnetic words in your titles. Magnetic words are things like free, and these are so cheesy, but oh my gosh, they work. Free, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. People love lists of things, and they love lists of things that have odd numbers in them, so it's not the top 10 reasons why you need to blah, whatever your company does. It's the top seven reasons why. We typically saw, see in behavioral studies that whenever you have a top 11 versus a top 10, the top 11 list is three times more likely to be clicked on in red just because it's a weird number. Whenever you have prices and you're posting prices online, things that really catch people's attention, it was something when something is $9 even, not $8.99. Be different. Draw attention to yourself. And it's really small things you can do, but whenever you're coming up with content, and this goes to blog posts, it goes to Twitter accounts, it goes to anything, do things where you're doing one thing versus another, so point, counterpoint. The other thing is a list with an odd number in the list. And the other thing is we still love free stuff. Y'all are here because this was free. And I'm totally worth it. Um, keep your titles as brief as possible. Add attractive keywords and metadata. Whenever you go, and we'll talk about this later on in another Facebook class, but whenever we're going and we're blogging and we're taking our, our content from our blog and then we're, we're sharing it around the internet and reposting it on other sites, we need to make sure that whenever we're posting that stuff on, say, our Facebook account, every opportunity we have, all those extra little boxes they give us to fill in, like on Google Plus and on YouTube and all these different sites, you need to fill those in mainly because most people are too lazy to do it and simply the fact that you fill in the tags and you don't fill in 40 tags you fill in two or three to make sure that you're specific but the fact that you go and take the time to put in metadata when they ask you when they ask you for a specific title that's different from the title on your blog write a different title because it means now you can be found under two different titles take the time to do that stuff this is that effort but it pays off like crazy We'll talk about images here in a second. Make sure that when you take, when, when, when you look at a picture, if the picture is eh, don't use it. Use pictures that are striking, that draw people in. Make sure you add social sharing buttons everywhere. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And this is something that um, I really, really have taken to heart since I've met Tom, is the fact that it's so much more important to take the time to write quality content versus posting something every single day just because you can. It's not a numbers game anymore. And the way that you stand out, 
You are so much better off by taking the time to write a well thought out blog post that is 500 words long every two weeks versus junk that's two paragraphs long every single day. And it's funny because whenever someone states the obvious like that, when Tom states, states that to me, I'm like, that's the content that I read a lot. Of course that works. And it totally kind of changed my paradigm because me being an SEO guy, we're typically all about volume. Just get as much crap out there as you can and make the, you know, make the search engines eat it. But what happens is, is you lead all the horses to water, but they don't drink and they just walk away. So you've got to make sure that when you're doing this stuff, if you can create great quality content twice a week, bring it on. But be more focused on the quality, and, and I'll show you a couple of things here in a little bit that kind of get to that. And, and this kind of speaks, A, to quality. It speaks to, to kind of using striking images as well. Now, um, because I don't know how to write, I, I decided, you know, if I'm going to get into marketing and search, I've got to have something that allows me to create content that allows me to do things that add to the team that, that, that I'm working with that actually is a skill set that the team members typically don't have. And so I choose photography and video. And if you look at some of these imager, images, some of these are kind of iconic, like the kind of typical bron you know, bunk and bronco at, at, uh, at a rodeo, two things that happen just completely because I happened to be at the right spot at the right time and I got totally lucky. Uh, this woman was completely drunk off her gourd at Kerrville Folk Festival. She's out there dancing by herself. She's kicking up dust. The sun's hitting her at the right spot, and I got this amazing image with all, these, with, with all the rays coming through. Right here, FC Dallas scores a goal, and I happen to just turn around at the crowd right when the fireworks are going off, and I snap the shot. Um, this was right before I got kicked out of the KISS concert because I was not supposed to be standing there. Um, and then iconic shots like this. I mean, just the fact that you're kind of at the country fair. This is up in Oklahoma. You got these high school kids dancing, and she was actually the, the, uh, the, the, the queen of the fair. Um, she, she had gone up and accepted her crown, went, went back and changed into jeans and a T-shirt and boots and went out dancing. Um, and then doing things with filters. I mean, this was a pretty blah picture when I took it, but I literally put it in Instagram and used Instagram to change the, the look and feel of that image and pulled that out. And it was funny because I tried in Aperture and Photoshop to make this picture pop the way I wanted it to, and I put the stupid thing in Instagram, hit one stupid button, and it was like amazing. So makes me feel like I need to work on my uh, skills in Photoshop more. Now, why? from the standpoint, well, that's actually a good point. Why? Yeah, why? Um, now, the other thing is, is whenever you're promoting multimedia on Facebook, it's really critical that, A, we're creating content that is eye-catching, that makes people actually look and do something. The other thing is, is what can we do for search engines? And if in, in any of y'all who have seen me speak before, I've gone through this a thousand times, and people still don't do it. It kills me if they don't. Um, this is Stephanie Briggs. She's from San Antonio. She goes by the stage name of the Little Brave. And I could go and take that picture of her and post it up on the Internet as is, and the search engines know that I took the, the picture with the Canon EOS uh, uh, 7D. They know the lens that I took it with. Um, some cameras, they may know the GPS coordinates, but that's about it. There's not a whole lot of detail that actually describes what the picture. Now, if I look at that picture, I'm thinking there's Stephanie Briggs. Uh, she's released her third album. Um, her name is Little Brave. She, she, her last album was from a bad relationship where she had an affair with a married man, and she feels like she's the one that got the bad deal. Um, she's, that, that's at Studio 141E over in Addison, Texas. We're taping an episode of Troubadour Text. I mean, all the stuff that I know about that, right? I would love the search engines to know about that information. Well, I can go and post the image and put some content in Flickr here that describes a little bit about what that picture is. But when you go up to Flickr and you tend to get a little bit too wordy, Flickr doesn't typically like that, number one. And number two, Flickr, even if you're paying for a pro account, absolutely forbids anyone from promoting anything. So I can go up to Flickr. If I put a link and say, click on this link to come and buy my photography or hire me, they will delete the picture and not even warn me. You are not allowed to promote. But there are hyperlinks in here. So after reading through, I'd mentioned kind of jokingly reading the terms of service. If you're doing marketing and you read terms of services on these sites, you can find loopholes. And the biggest loophole I found in Flickr is that I noticed that whenever I'm putting information in the description, they will let me put a hyperlink. So I'm thinking, okay, well, I can't promote anything. I can't have a call to action. But if I describe something and put my keywords around it, because the search engines don't understand context, I still win. And I may not get a conversion right here. I would hope that people, if they like the picture and want to know more about me, they go there. 
But for the most part, all I'm worried about is having a link there with a descriptive uh, piece of text before or after it, and that's all I need to help out, you know, to get Google to help me out, right? So in iPhoto, you've got some basic features that allow you to put in a title and descriptions, and within iPhoto, which is free with every Mac you buy, in, in I don't know the version they have this on Windows, but Windows has a similar app, um, you can't really put a hyperlink in there. What happens if you go in there and you try to write code, then it gets all garbled up, and, and when it comes out to Flickr and Google Plus and Facebook, you get all this HTML code that's been like converted and it looks all ugly. But because I have a background building search engines for 15 years, I do know that whenever a search engine comes through and looks at this content, if we go backwards, when a search engine comes and looks at these words, and right here, this is a hyperlink with nothing on top of it. When a search engine sees that link with not, with, without having a word on top of it, the search engine looks about five to seven words this way and about five to seven words that way to try to figure out what that link means. So you don't have to know how to write HTML code to get the SEO benefit. Because whenever I go and I plug something into to, to iPhoto like this, and it says Kylie Ray Harris hyphen HTTP colon slash slash KylieRayHarris.com, plays for an appreciative audience at Studio 41E during a taping of Troubadour, Texas. That right there, there's no HTML code. I typed in the web address, but that was it. When that goes to Flickr, Flickr converts that to a live link, and then Google sees that that is a link that goes to Kylie Ray Harris's website, Studio 41E, uh, and Troubadour, Texas are associated with it. And that's how you start building up your brand and growing your brand without even knowing how to write code. Now, if you get really nuts, you can get an application like Aperture, and Aperture gives you all kinds of, actually gives you a place to plug in keywords that your SM, SEO ranks for, more kind of location information, much, much longer infor, uh, list of uh, things you can plug in, and all this stuff gets plugged in, gets saved inside of that picture on the internet, and so when Google comes in and picks up this picture now, whether it's on Google Plus or Facebook, or Flickr or anywhere, when Google sees that picture, this is now what Google sees. Google knows exactly what's happening. I strongly caution you, make sure that your content here is actually descriptive of what's in the picture. Don't go up and get pictures of cute little puppies and write all about your business inside the pictures. You will, you will feel pain in Google like you never knew. And even when you look, look at an image like this, when I post it on the internet, that's all that the user sees. I'm not spamming people that are, in, that, that are looking at my photography. Yes, sir? What is your name on uh, Live Loud Texas. Wild. Live, yeah, wild. Okay. That's me. Uh, Live Loud Texas. It's pretty much uh, the same name I use everywhere except for Twitter. Can um, I ask? Oh. Sure, no, go ahead. Sorry, okay, about the image editor. So I've been using paint.net. Mm-hmm. Um, get um, Photoshop Express, is that what it's called, or Elements? The cheaper version of Photoshop will allow you to do that. I think that's like $59 or something like that. Uh, and and, and go, you can, there's plenty of image editors, and I guess, is GIMP for Linux, or is that on Windows 2? I don't know. Also, Lightroom is nice, because you can change hundreds of yeah. things with one command. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the nice thing. I mean, when you get into things like Lightroom, Aperture, and Photoshop, yeah, the batch editing is amazing. Because I can go in, and I can write this stuff once and apply it to a 1,000 pictures like that. What's like the price point? Lightroom is up there. Lightroom's probably a few hundred bucks, probably. $1,095. Okay, so that, and that is a ridiculously good app. Yeah, they just added the price it's really good. They just added it to their creative cloud, so the $50 a month gives you Lightroom in addition. Actually, that's, yeah. Um, that's what Adobe's got the subscription service that I, that I signed up to two months ago. Insanely ridiculous. It's 50 bucks a month and you get everything they make. And, and if you had one of the 50 bucks a month, you forget about that. And, yeah, anything that goes on a credit card, it just doesn't even exist. It's like <laughs> if I've got checks, I must have money, right? Yeah. Um, so, video, let's talk a little bit about video. And this is one of the biggest things. So, so um, Adobe, if you buy. That, 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 that subscription service, um, they have an application called Bridge that allows you to add metadata to video files as well. The one biggest thing that I want to talk to you guys about about video though is number one, make sure the content's good, duh. Um, but also, P 
pe I tend to see people will go and grab the videos that, they ha that they've had made for them and they make themselves, and they upload them to YouTube, they upload them to, to, to Facebook by itself. And the challenge that I have with that is that, number one, Facebook Insights, which we're going to look at a little bit, will track all the video views on YouTube for you. Okay. Number two is that if you're going and trying to create a, a brand that has got a lot of reach, that in, in a lot of the reason why, uh, a lot of the ways that you do that is to be able to game those systems so your content shows up when people is, are looking for it. One of the biggest things you can do is take a piece of content from one place and then instead of uploading a new file somewhere else, take that and embed it because what ends up happening is you get credit on Facebook for the view and you're also getting credit on YouTube in, in the case of video. So unless you're working for a nonprofit or a church or a faith-based uh, organization, the reason why I say that is because you typically have no idea what's going to show up when that video stops playing. Um, uh, but if you're working for an organization that's not unbelievably conservative, I really recommend that people upload their video to YouTube and then embed it everywhere. And that's super easy to do. We're going to go find, oh, why did I do that? Come on, I had it all set up so it would be all smooth. And then I escaped. Okay, so um, actually since I opened up an airport, Let's find a video with a plane crash on it to tell people what service they can expect from my airport. So all I'm going to do here is highlight the URL up there before we see too much pain and destruction. We'll go back over to Facebook. And because I'm logged in, I don't need to do anything like special like going into the... Uh, the admin pane or anything, that's going to show because I haven't hit it yet. As soon as I hide this, it won't show up again until I tell it to, to, to show again. But you don't have to go in to do anything crazy in the admin pane to post a video. Because I'm an administrator on the site, I can just go right here, click into my composer, paste that, and look at that. It goes ahead and he pulls the video directly from YouTube. Now here's something else that's really interesting. Oh my gosh, what's the URL? Is it no code? I don't think that's it. I've got to think about this. You guys have to remind me. There, there is a domain that we can plug into YouTube that will actually make the video appear as though it's coming directly from your page and not from YouTube to the user. And the reason why that becomes really critical is that if you go in and plug that in on your blog for a YouTube video, then all those analytics start showing up onto your blog as being traffic every time somebody watches that YouTube video. And you've got to think about the way that search engines work. They're looking at the traffic on your site as part of the algorithm to determine where you show up in search ranking. So the more things you can do to make your site look like it's getting a lot of activity, it feeds that monster and it helps your, your web page show up in the search engine results. How do you do that? Um, it, I cannot think for the line. What is the domain? You, it's you like you... It, no, it's like youtube.com hyphen no code or something like that. I don't think that no code is it. That's not it. Um, it's, it. It's basically a website that they don't promote publicly, but I, but I know the URL. I used to know it because I know people that work at YouTube. I just need to look at my blog and see how I plug that in. But whenever you guys go and, and, and download this presentation, my contact information is there. Shoot me an email and I'll tell you what that URL is because I've got it in my notes at home. Um, uh, well, when, when, whenever we're done here, then shoot, contact me once I get home. I'll grab that and send you a sample of what that looks like. How, how do you refer to that specific URL? On. Oh, okay. Let me go back. No, if you don't pay attention, you're gonna. I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Okay, so let's go find a different one. This is the knowing plane crash, whatever that is. So I, so I go to the video that I, that I want to put on my Facebook fan page. And I come up to the top here where the URL is, and I highlighted that. See, it's all blue. And I'm going to copy that. Now, I can do, on, on the Mac, I can do just a, a Command C in the menus. You do copy there. Then I go back over to my fan page. And right here where I'd normally type in a message to somebody, I just, I can do a right click. If it lets me and do a paste. So that URL is there. And the second that URL shows up, Facebook goes out and renders that video for me. 
And the nice thing about this is I'll go ahead and post it too, is that when someone comes to the site and they play it, the, the, the video player opens up so you can see the entire video inside your wall. And what's happening here is that you're watching the video on Facebook, which means that you're getting the count for the view on your YouTube account, and it's also being counted inside of Facebook Insights. So you're getting double the credit for this on your content. And if you're going out doing things where, again, you want to make sure that anything you do on Facebook, if it can benefit you in the search engine on YouTube, then you need to do that. You know, and these, these are the types of small kind of tips that people don't really know why necessarily people post to YouTube or they post, you know, or they upload to Facebook. People just kind of do it because they just do whatever they do. Um, but there's a lot of reasons behind making sure that your brand is strong online why you would want to do this versus upload your video fresh to YouTube using YouTube or Facebook using their own video player. And, and this kind of falls through to everything. You, if you have a video about your brand that's on your YouTube channel, that is embedded everywhere. You put it on Google+, Plus, you put it in your blog, you put it on your corporate website, it's all embedded from YouTube. Yes, sir? If you hit the share button, it'll give you a short link rather than a long link. Mm -hmm. Um, that'll show up, it renders for you, but if I give you this trick later on, then that won't work if you use the short link. Which if you're embedding, you really, you really don't need a short link anyway. Yeah. And also, once you paste the link there, you can actually delete that and write something about the video and not actually yes. the link there. The video will still yes. Along. So if we come up here and edit this, because yeah, because that video has been embedded inside this. I don't want to delete that, I just want to edit. How do I do that, Leanne? You'll have to show me that later. I know what you're talking about because I, I, I just cut it right after I Oh, right after you paste it. So right I, paste I, it in embeds. And then I'll go back and delete all of that and then write, you know, knowing the playing cards was gonna happen, I would have never flown. And then just hit and then it stayed the video stays there. Taking spell better too. But you're not getting yeah. credit that way, right? Yeah. No, you are. Well, yeah, you are. Yeah. It's, How it's, um, well, what you would do is you would use that workaround, and as soon as you plug it in in the, in the video renders, Facebook has then embedded it. Then you can delete it and then type something in. If, if I looked at your blog, mm -hmm. posted a video, and I looked at the source code, would I see Yes, that? yeah. Just on, on, the, on my Tumblr blog or on Live, Live Loud Texas, it'll be in there. Okay. So there's that lesson on embedding. A couple of more things, and then we can take more questions and drink beer. Um, making sure that you go and, and you use the tools that Facebook provides to you, number one, to embed Facebook throughout your site. And if you go to the Level 10 site, you know, obviously they, they have the kind of the standard chiclets up on the top of every page on the site so you can find them easily. But they also embed widgets inside their corporate site and inside their blog so that you can kind of see who is, is, is already fans of, of the brand and, and what people are doing. A um, couple of other things and examples of other chiclets, and uh, th this is share this. This is not directly from Facebook, but um, on, on the GeekBeak blog, whenever whenever I write an article there, I don't have to do anything because this is built into WordPress. So so um, the Level 10 site is Drupal, and, and and actually Level 10 has built a bunch of social plugins that you can use that Tom uh, has uh, meetups about all the time. In WordPress, this is share this, which which actually works on any platform. Um, this example up here is, while it's design-wise fairly hideous, this is the Troubadour Texas site, and we went to the extent of actually taking those chick looks and rebranding them so they melted directly into the site itself. And right here, this over here, you, you can go to Facebook and get a plugin like this that basically has the latest posts from your Facebook wall. Well, we took that and redesigned it, so this is still feeding directly from Facebook, but we changed the CSS so it feeds and it bleeds into the rest of the design on the site. So there's all kinds of things you can do, stuff that doesn't require code and stuff that requires quite a bit of code. Yes, sir? Yes, and what I would recommend is you always post to YouTube first. That becomes your source. So YouTube comes first, and then you take that video from YouTube and post everywhere else. And two reasons why. Number one, YouTube is the largest video sharing site in the world. It's owned by Google. And a third reason, it's the second largest search engine in the world. There's more searches on Google every day than on, on Yahoo and, my, and being combined. And even there's more searches than on Facebook every day on, on, on YouTube. So, yeah, you always put your stuff on YouTube first, and then 
you, you, you share that video from YouTube everywhere else throughout the world. Um, if you go to uh, Facebook... I'm sorry, it, do you have a similar recommendation on photos? Yes, and I, and I use Flickr for my photo yeah. sharing site. So, and the thing you got to be careful, though, with Flickr is that Flickr has sharing widgets. This, these are what the sharing widgets look like on Facebook. And if you, type, if you go to Facebook on their search box and type in widgets or sharing or apps, this pops up. And these are all cut and paste, no code required. Flickr has the same stuff. The thing that's kind of weird about Flickr, though, is that if, you, if I take the direct URL, like I do a right click on a picture on Flickr and take that link and then post it into a site, Flickr will get mad at me and delete that. They specifically say in the terms of service, you cannot take our content and then distribute it from another website. But they have sharing buttons that do the same thing for you. So make sure on Flickr uh, that you, you use things that call their API and pull that image and you still get credit for the views and all that stuff on those as well. Uh, Flickr is awesome, because it's not. <laughs> fl fl Flickr is just the largest photo sharing site. It's the only reason why I'm, I base it on that. And, and, and Google absolutely loves it. Now, Google owns Picasa, but oh my gosh, they, gi they give you crazy amounts of search engine credit in Flickr. Google's actually shutting down Picasa. And that would be another reason. Oh, I'll act like I knew that. Just because it's, it's the 800-pound gorilla. It's just the largest platform out there. And, and, and there are photo sharing sites like 500px uh, is amazing. Absolutely gorgeous uh, uh, interface. And it's kind of like the Vimeo of photo sharing, but it's only a bunch of photo nerds there. I mean, it's not, you know, no one really goes there. So I just use, and, and, and I would switch brands in a second on photo sharing. You know, I don't really care. It's just that it's the biggest one out there. And, and my testing shows that Google absolutely loves Flickr. Yes. Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with Facebook. And, 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 and when we're talking about videos, I'm certainly concerned about you taking YouTube and posting it everywhere. I upload images directly to Facebook all the time. There are, there are widgets, though, that allow you to, to do a plug-in on Facebook that pull from Flickr. I'm not concerned about people seeing my stuff on Flickr. I'm concerned about me being able to game the search engines with Flickr. So if no one ever looks at my pictures, I don't care. I'm concerned about all that text I have in them because I know Google eats that up and, and I can get great SEO benefit out of it. Now, I do kind of want picture, people to see my pictures, but not in the same way that I'm concerned about views on a video. So, you know, to that extent, it's not a huge deal. And then insights. Do I have this linked up? I do not on that one. Let me look at, let's look at Facebook insights real quick because it's real fun. Let's go to hide that. So this is basically my kind of personal boutique because I'm an independent contractor, kind of my personal business page. Why are we dead? Here we go. All right. Okay. So this is basically Google Analytics for Facebook. And it's painfully obvious whenever I stop paying attention to it and when I post something again, what happens? Um, now this right here, this drop is just because I ignored my page for a couple of weeks. I didn't really know the reason why that happens. But typically what you want to look at when you're looking at Insight, can I get a longer date range, please? Where are my date ranges? Oh, they're killing me. They've changed this up on me. Oh, Google's not killing Picasso. It's just changing its name. Okay. Fair enough. So let me type this in to say 2011. To, that's good. We'll go there. Apply that. Yay, there's been improvements. Okay. Still didn't do what I wanted to on this page. But basically, what, what we're looking for when we come in and look at Facebook Insights is every day you go through your site and you're posting stuff, you're talking to people, people are commenting on your page and stuff like that. And... Facebook will come in and say, give, give you metrics for how many posts did you make per day. And you see I only made you know, hardly any posts at all during this time period. People are talking about this. That's basically telling you how many people are sharing your stuff, commenting on your stuff, liking it, and doing stuff like that. And then weekly uh, total reach. Whenever someone comes in, and number one, whenever I post something to my page, and then when people go and act upon it, a certain size of an audience goes and gets to see that content. Now, 
on this page, I've got 6,000 people that like this page. That does not mean that every time I post something that it shows up in front of 6,000 people. On average, only about 8% of your audience actually sees every post you put up because Facebook, in its infinite wisdom, has decided that it's smarter about what, we're, what we want to see than we are, right? And so, A, that's, prob that, that, that's partially because they want to keep all the noise down all, on our timelines and not have all this crazy stuff flying up there the way it does on Twitter. But shockingly, they just came out with a product <laughs> that allows you to actually pay to have your own content show up more in often in front of your own audience. So now Facebook, after they've done this and they've come up with this algorithm that says, we're going to, de depending upon what people do on their walls and what they talk about, if I've got someone who likes my stuff that never talks about social media, never talks about music, never talks about photography, they're hardly ever going to see my content. But if I have people that talk about social media all the time and photography, then they're going to see a lot more of my stuff. Well, Facebook will now give me the honor of paying them to actually get in front of more of these people than I would without paying them. And here's the funny part. When you pay them, there's still an algorithm that says you can still at maximum only reach about 40% of your audience no matter how much you pay them. Right now, that's the situation. But the basic, the basic rule of thumb on this first graph that you look at, and I really wish I had this kind of built out a little bit better so you all could see it, is what you're looking for is you're looking for, number one, whenever you see spikes in the amount of reach, and spikes in the, in the green line that tells you people are talking about something, that means you're on to something. And you can come over here and actually look and say, okay, well, on this, this is, this is on, on the, the week of 5.30 to 6.5, the stuff I posted actually got in front of 681 people. So if I was looking at that and that was a spike, and the week afterwards it reached 34 people, the basic thing I learn is do less of that, do more of that. That is all the deep thinking that we have to do whenever you're starting off on Facebook. Now, clearly, as you become more and more mature about the way you market stuff on Facebook, these things become fairly complex fairly quickly. But since you're getting started, that's all I want you to do. Look at insights, do more of this, do less of that. This means I need to do less of doing less, actually. Um, Absolutely, because that reaches, and they tell you, when, when you look at that top line, that is, includes the other people's audiences. Now, when we talk about targeting, yes? How do you know what you are doing at a point in time? Um, well, we have, we have things, the milestones, so whenever we feature something, that can help us whenever we think something's going to pop. But also, I keep on forgetting I can look down here. This right here tells you the week that we're looking at. And you actually, when you, when you come in and look at things like likes, if that week 530 to 6.5 is what something I wanted to look at, I can come in here, and actually that's been reset itself. I can come in here and look at information that tells me, you know, specifically what happened on this day. I got th on, on, on the 2nd of June, I got three new likes. And so what did I do on the 2nd of June that drew those three people there versus no likes on these days? So you have to do a little bit of kind of finagling of what, uh, of what the data is and kind of think about on that day what was happening. But you can easily at least drill it down to the day and see what was in, and know what you did on that day and, and know to go back and do more of that stuff. So out of curiosity, yes, mm -hmm. I'm also seeing unlikes. So does uh -huh. that tell you a little bit about people? You know, Absolutely. Yeah, when I talk about how dumb I think Obama is, I get a lot of those. Because okay. in tech, yeah. Yeah. tech people don't like conservatives. So... Um, yeah, when I start getting political, I see like people dropping off my fan base fast because, you know, as as kind of a, you know, conservative guy, I'm I'm kind of a rare breed in tech and in design and stuff like that. Um, even though we're in Texas, um, this is this right here would be typically a cause of concern. But the reason why this is like this is because I had an article from Geekbeat that got republished in two magazines over, or two websites in the Philippines, and that's why that's like that. So normally I'd look at that and say, what on earth is going on there? Because it should be the US. But I can go back and look at my data and say that that GoPro article that I used in the previous example was repeated because they can't get access to that, art, to, to that new accessory for the GoPro camera right now. But there's a lot of interest, over, interest in Asia, so that's why that shows up like that. So it is interesting when you, whenever you want to come through and kind of look and see and make sure your traffic is coming from the places that it should be coming from, number one. Number two, um, 
are you reaching into audiences that you didn't know existed? I have one client that we went and looked at their Facebook Insight, and they're getting tons of traffic from Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. And this is a luxury brand. Well, it's about the richest place on the planet. And they never, ever, ever thought that they should even be marketing outside of Texas right now. I'm like, holy cow. You've got an audience there that is trying to figure out, and we watch what they do on the website, and they're looking for a shopping cart that allows them to purchase internationally, but it doesn't exist. And we're like, that is money you're leaving on the table. So they're trying to figure out now what are the customs rules and everything that they have to go through in order to uh, be able to sell to the Middle East. So th this stuff can give you a lot of good detailed information. Did someone raise their hand? No, no, no. And then other fun things like reach, um, male to female, um, uh, you, you, you know, depending on different age groups, what are you talking about and what are people reaching? Because I talk about music quite a bit, I get more uh, women than most nerds would. My wife keeps close tabs on that. Um, and then they're talking about this. These are, you know, the specific days. What are people talking about in, in what countries and what, what are those posts? So, and then it tells you whenever you have things that a lot of people talk about, what kind of uh, reach does it have virally? So you may have in this situation, this many people talking about this and the virality kind of goes up, which means it's getting shared more. So that's just another way to look in kind of another dimension of looking at the content you're producing. What is it doing for your brand and how is it kind of growing legs and traveling for you? Lots of fun stuff, and uh, we will do eventually, probably in 2013, after I get through these first classes, we'll do a whole class on analytics and kind of tracking your brand online like that. So, whether you're going to attack something by yourself, and we're wrapping up now, um, whether you're going to attack something by yourself or whether you're going to go out and hire someone to do something for you, you need to kind of sit back and think about what kind of campaign are we going to go after, and there's all different sizes. So, typically, if you're going to start off by yourself, and you're going to learn some basic SEO, I would typically come in and say, okay, we'll learn how to do real basic keyword research, nothing more than using the free Google keyword tool and figuring out what 10, or 10 to 25 keywords are that you want to focus on. And then I would say go and work on getting 10 pages of your site optimized and then schedule-wise try to get five good quality posts on Facebook out per week or 10 Twitter tweets out per week. Uh, Twitters, twits. Medium-sized campaign, whether it's the size of your business or you're hiring an agency to do this for you, add what we just talked about. Add 15 more pages, so you're optimizing 25 pages. Add YouTube and Flickr, and then figure out how to get Google Analytics set up so you can be tracking what's happening on your website. And then the next size, uh, do 50 pages, and then add a blog. Learn about bookmarking through like StumbleUpon and Delicious and stuff like that, and start getting multiple people within your agent, within your company or on your team trained so that you're not doing this all by yourself. Because one of the biggest things that, that we have an issue with in this stuff is people just get burnt out. There's a lot to learn, and none of it's hard, and it's all super fun, and we have the best job in the world. But sometimes you want to go outside and see the sunshine and things like that. So having more people on the team or having an agency that can kind of help you out with some of this stuff is super beneficial. Um, other way you can look at it is, you know, you know different levels of, of a campaign. You know, do you start with Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn? Once you get good with that and you feel comfortable with it, again, I, once you do these basic ones, and I don't have Google Plus in here, uh, but, but you could, you know, kind of decide which ones work for you. After you do the first two or three kind of regular social media sites, I always want you to start doing media, photography and video on some level. And you may not have all the video skills to go and have like a big production crew, but almost anybody can get screencasting software and do training videos and informational videos that can talk about your, your services and what you can help people with. And just from the standpoint of you know, what's hip and kind of being on the cutting edge, Pinterest and Instagram are good to be involved with right now. We don't know what's going to happen with them. I would assume that Instagram will end up getting rolled up into Facebook and will go away, but it'll still do what it's, what it'll be like Facebook pictures or something. Um, and then Dig and Delicious are, are bookmarking. Again, that's, that's for a more advanced class. And then kind of talk about, you know, this last little guy on the pot is actually an RSS feed. I didn't realize he was on the pot until I looked at it right now. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, Tom, if you, if you want to talk more details about having Level 10 does all this stuff, Tom's email address is right there. 
Um, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to anybody who wants more details. And, and we're doing training classes all the time. And like he gave you the schedule there. Um, training classes for the social media stuff, not the Drupal stuff that's coming up. So next month we'll do integrating social media with email marketing. August, YouTube basics. It'll be nothing but, but video and YouTube for business. Uh, September we'll do uh, basically advertising pay-per-click on Facebook. Uh, Twitter ghosts and goblins. Do you get that? It's October, Ghosts and Goblins. Get that? Um, bad stuff not to do on Twitter is basically that class. Um, general search engine optimization basics. Um, and then rolling out the year to plan for 2013. What are the best practices you need to be considering for your business to roll into the next year? And again, the, the site is meetup.com slash ROWDFW. Those are other things that I'm doing other places. And Tom and I are also going to be doing uh, workshops and classes up at the Gravity Center up in Plano as well. So if you go to gravitycenterdallas.com, uh, when Jennifer gets back from Central America, she'll post those up, John. Um, but we'll be doing those on a monthly basis too. And other questions. You guys are really good. I really appreciate when you guys ask questions in the middle because it like kind of keeps things.